Maybe the most important fact that we can come to understand about global warming and climate change is our responses to it. For instance, people commonly think of CO2 as a pollutant, but it's not. It's a naturally occurring greenhouse gas, but it's not even the most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and it makes up 95% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. CO2 is less than 4% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and humans only put out a small part of that, just a small portion. More importantly, if you look at the history of the Earth, for hundreds of millions of years, CO2 levels have risen and fallen. For most of that time, they've been much higher than now, and temperature has risen and fallen. But there's been no correlation or connection between the two. Temperatures have been higher while CO2 levels have been lower. CO2 levels have been higher while temperatures have been about the same as they are right now. No connection. Now recently, the temperature has increased about a degree over the past 150 years. And CO2 levels, largely since 1950, have increased by about 100 parts per million. But it's not clear that the present warming is connected to the increased CO2 levels, especially since half that warming occurred before most of the CO2 was put in the atmosphere by humans. In addition, the climate models that make this connection and the science that makes this connection is there are notable and substantial weaknesses. Even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change say, admit they understand little to nothing about 75% of the factors that cause warming and cooling of the globe. And their climate models are all over the place in their predictions. Despite the fact they all use the same physics and the same inputs, they're all over the map concerning global temperature. They all indicate that the upper atmosphere should warm faster and to a greater degree than ground level. But just the opposite is occurring. The models get something as fundamental as that wrong. They just can't be trusted. All the predictions of harm that they put forward, all these things that they say should be happening or that global warming will cause, they're just not coming to pass. For instance, they say sea levels should be rising very rapidly. But guess what? Now, sea levels are rising, let's be clear but they've risen 400 feet over the last 18,000 years. And they're rising at a slower rate now than they have on average for most of that time. Hurricanes. Hurricanes have shown no trend in increasing number or severity or strength, despite the fact that CO2 levels have increased by 100 parts per million and the Earth has warmed. This runs afoul of the theory and the models. Polar bears. People say that global warming is going to cause polar bears to go extinct. While the Earth has warmed more than a degree, while CO2 levels have increased substantially, the polar bear populations have gone from around 5,000 at the middle of the century to more than 25,000 today. And of the 20 distinct polar bear populations, while two are decreasing, two others are increasing, and most of them are stable. And oddly enough, the ones that are decreasing are in areas where it's actually gotten cooler according to the temperature measurements. And the ones that are increasing are in areas where the Earth has warmed. Even if we aren't showing any indications now that warming is causing disasters, some scientists believe that if it continues to warm, bad things will happen. You will have more starvation, more hunger. You'll have more cases of tropical disease, just to take two things, for example. But all the treaties, all the proposals put forward so far to prevent these bad things from happening would do nothing. In fact, Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol, the treaty that was put forward in 1997 to, uh, for industrialized countries to cut their greenhouse gas emissions to prevent future warming, it would reduce warming 100 years from now by less than a fifth of a degree. Less than a fifth of a degree. It does nothing to prevent warming. And the cost for, well, for Kyoto, about $150 billion annually, for proposals that make more severe restrictions on greenhouse gas emissions, like trying to cap greenhouse gas emissions at 550 parts per million, uh, which is double the pre-industrial rate, that, that rate they think might prevent most of the danger, well, that would cost trillions of dollars. And what would it do for malaria? It would reduce the incidence of malaria by less than half of 1%. It would reduce the amount of hunger in the world by less than 10%. For a trillion dollars, it's less than 10% reduction. What we need to be focusing our efforts on is adapting to climate change regardless of the cause. 
Adapting to climate change means taking steps now to prevent malaria, taking steps now to prevent hunger. And by doing so now, we could cut the incidence of malaria in half from 2 million deaths a year to less than 1 million deaths a year. We could cut the incidence of hunger in half, not half of 1%, not 10%, 50%, at a fraction of the cost. We should be focusing our efforts on doing the most good with the resources that we have, rather than expending precious resources and doing very little good. These are the stark proposals that sort of confront us. And when economists, including three Nobel Prize winners have looked at it, looked at various problems that the UN says face humanity, they looked at 17 proposals to prevent harm, and fighting climate change came in dead last as reducing the least harm for the amount of money spent. In fact, you would for every dollar spent fighting climate change, you get about 17 cents in return of benefits. The purpose of the Global Warming Primer is to explore some of the scientific, economic, and political issues surrounding the topic of global warming, and in the process, dispel some of the misunderstandings, misstatements, and myths surrounding climate history, our understanding of present warming, and the possible responses to climate change in the future.